Welcome back to the all electric pickup build. In the last episode, I talked about chassis selection and pulled the existing gas engine from the truck, leaving us with plenty of room for shenanigans in the engine bay. And in this video, I'll discuss the electric motor that I'm using and some options that you might consider if you were to do this yourself. There are a variety of electric motors suitable for homemade EVs, and they don't necessarily have to be marketed as being specifically for vehicular use. I'm gonna split this discussion up into three main classifications of motors. One type that was not necessarily intended for use in electric vehicle conversions, but you might be able to get it to work. Ones like this that are manufactured specifically for homemade electric vehicle conversions. And motors that are salvaged from modern production electric vehicles like Teslas and Nissan Leafs. But first, a brief lesson on alternating and direct current motors. Those technologies have been around a long time, and for a while, DC motors were popular in EVs due to their simplicity and their cost-effectiveness. They can come in brushed or brushless configurations, brushless usually having higher efficiency, and rarely are used with regenerative braking. Some cars with DC electric motors use plug braking, which is a form of braking where the motor is used to slow down the car by generating energy and dissipating it within the controller in the form of heat. AC motors dominate today's production EV market due to their high efficiency. Also, pretty much all EVs on the market use AC induction drive and offer regenerative braking, which helps a bit with range. All right, so back to our aforementioned discussion of the three types of motors that you can use in EVs. First up, we're gonna talk about the Frankensteins, the ones that weren't necessarily manufactured for use in vehicles, but you could make it work if you play your cards right. And the reason for pursuing this route is all about cost. These will more often than not, probably 100% of the time, be a direct current motor. For example, if you can find an electric forklift motor that suits your needs for say $200, you might have just saved 95% of your budget on that portion of your project. However, there are some very important considerations if you chose to go this way. Assuming the motor is in working condition and doesn't need any renewal of any windings or bearings, you'll still need to confirm that its rated voltage and amperage are appropriate for your application. These ratings relate directly to the amount of speed and torque that will be sent to the wheels of your car. And a good place to start might be to consider the specs of an existing combustion engine. This did not come out of this truck. I already sold the engine that came out of this truck. This is for a totally different project entirely, but we'll look at this one as an example. An older four cylinder might have an RPM range of between zero and 8,000 RPM and an output torque of around 100 foot pounds. So consider that you might want an electric motor with specs similar to these, but maybe with a lower top speed, unless you plan on redlining it all the time. Personally, I set a goal of around 3,000 RPM, considering that's normally where you drive your car at and output torque of around 100 foot-pounds. You can usually find these specs on a little metal plate that's attached to the housing of the motor. Let's talk about a common scenario you might run into where you find a motor that is rated for the right torque and amperage, but it doesn't have high enough speed for your goals. Maybe it is rated for 2000 RPM at 72 volts, but you wanna get a speed of at least 2500 RPM for the speed of your car that you desire. With electric motors, the rotating speed, RPM, is directly proportional to the voltage applied to it. Therefore, if you apply 96 volts to the motor, it would now have a top speed of around 2600 RPM. This is called overvolting, and it's somewhat common to do, especially on e-bikes. But if you choose to do this, there's no guarantee that it's safe and it won't break the motor. In the worst case, zorching will occur. That's a real word. Arcs can cause your motor to go kaput, or it could get overheated due to the additional current and melt wires or cause fires. So consider the risk of overvolting your motor and consult the internet to see if anyone's done testing with your specific motor at your desired voltage. All right, that's all for the Frankensteins. Let's talk now about motors that have been manufactured specifically for EV retrofits. You can find these in AC and DC configurations but again, most projects will use AC for its higher efficiency and regenerative braking capabilities. You can pretty much find motors in any size, weight, speed, and torque output you desire. Most are between seven and 11 inches in diameter and have an operating voltage ranging between 72 and 180 volts, so there's no need for overvolting in this case. 
Another nice thing about these is that a lot of times they'll have a recommended controller for them, so you know the two will work together well. Most of these will be between $2,500 and $4,500 new, but you may be able to find one secondhand if someone in your area is parting out an old project. And lastly, what about electric motors that have been salvaged from production EVs like a Model 3 or a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt? These have several benefits, namely reliability most of the time. And if you're using a Tesla drive unit, small or large drive unit, much, much higher power than the last two options. Two that come to mind are the Nissan LEAF and the Tesla large drive unit or LDU. While the benefits are evident, there are also some drawbacks, one of which is cost. A Tesla drive unit is usually over $10,000 and that's about twice what I spent on my entire conversion. The other may be a pro or a con, but they generally run on much higher voltages than the other types that I've discussed. Both the LEAF and the Tesla packs are over 300 volts, which adds a lot of weight and cost to a project. It also requires a lot more space dedicated to the batteries. Since some of these motors have such high power outputs, they also require liquid cooling if they are used to their full potential. Liquid cooling obviously adds cost, complexity, and more failure points. So now we've discussed all your options, let's talk a little bit about the one that I chose. Surprise, surprise, it's a Frankenstein. Actually, it's one of the ones made specifically for EV retrofits, but it looks like Frankenstein, and I got it on Craigslist. This is a NetGain Warp 9 brushed DC motor. It's 9 inches in diameter, about 130 pounds, and is rated for 105 foot-pounds of torque. Its operating voltage is 72 to 144 volts, which provides an RPM output between 2200 and 4500 RPM, depending on the traction battery setup. It has a keyed output shaft on either end, one of which connects to the transmission input shaft, and another that can be used to power auxiliary equipment such as power steering or air conditioning, but I don't have plans for it yet. I pulled this out of someone's old project car, and as far as I can tell, the bearings and brushes are in good condition. If you look at how the motor is connected to the controller, you see there's one M- minus cable coming in here from the controller, and one returning to the B plus bar there to the controller. But there is also a small cable down below. Let's see if I can get that that connects the field windings and the armature windings in series. This means that this is a series wound DC motor. DC motors can be parallel wound, series wound, or compound wound, which is a combination of both. In general, series wound motors have the highest torque output because the full current, in this case 500 amps, is sent through both the armature and the field windings. Parallel wound and compound wound motors split this current yielding lower torque and making them unusable in anything bigger than a golf cart. I've spent a few weeks driving the truck around the neighborhood and so far I have to say I'm pretty happy with the motor and it provides plenty of torque. That's going to be the end of this video. If you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. And next time you see me, I'll be talking about how I mounted this motor in the truck and connected it to the existing Toyota transmission.